13 million Filipinos were affected by Typhoon Haiyan's wrath. Today, a third of survivors are homeless in the catastrophic aftermath. We're flying to Leyte, the hardest hit island, where towns were torn up and reduced to rubble. The Category 5 Super Typhoon hurtled through the Philippines at the speed of a Japanese bullet train. 600 kilometres wide, more powerful than Hurricane Katrina. Haiyan's fury hit land hours earlier than expected, dragging surging waves on shore. Leaving death and desperation everywhere. Despite the world's attention on this island, the plight of one small city has gone largely untold. Tanawan, one of the worst affected communities, was cut off for days. In the week after the disaster, we documented the chaos and the challenges here. I'm Drew Ambrose. On this edition of 101 East, we explore the human cost of the most powerful storm to hit the Philippines, Typhoon Haiyan. Tanawan, a city of 50,000 people, was wiped out in just minutes. Its business district hugged the shore. Now authorities call these streets the danger zone. Farmers, factory workers and fishermen are struggling to survive in what looks like a garbage dump. Hi. Thank you. Thanks very much. Brothers Elmer and Mariano are among them. They've been neighbours here for 10 years. This is where our house stood. The strong waters took it away. Now we've built a shack to live in. I built it yesterday so we can sleep. With their wives and children, the men weren't prepared for what was to strike. Describe to me what the storm was like. What did you hear? What did you feel? We were terrified of the howling winds. Once we felt the force of the wind, we wanted to stay indoors, but knew it was too dangerous to stay. When we tried to escape to my parents' home, the water was at our knees. Eight seconds later, we had to climb onto our roof. Soon, the house collapsed and we were washed into the water. At the time, I told my family to be strong. We can live through this. We will do everything to survive, so hold on to each other. At what point did you think you were going to die? A piece of debris knocked me off my plank of wood. When I recovered, I realized I had let go of my child. I was soon underwater and couldn't find anything to hold on to. I thought it was the end. It was a struggle to survive. We were all drowning. I lost sight of my wife. When I emerged from the water, my youngest son was being swept away. When he went under, I thought maybe I wanted to die. But how could my family live without their father? I held on. But saw my other son getting further from me. He called out, Papa, Papa. I couldn't reach him. In waves three times their height, the brothers survived by clinging to the top of a coconut tree. Both of their wives survived, but four children are missing. They're searching for them in this swamp. Elmer blames himself for not evacuating earlier. We searched for three days without eating or sleeping, with just the clothes on our backs. 
On the fourth day, my body badly needed food and we had to look for something to eat. But we still hope to find them, so we will know if they are alive or dead. Rescue workers continue to pull out bodies from a nearby river. Authorities have told the men to give up finding their children alive. More than 1,200 people died in Tanawan. Most were trapped in their homes. Mass graves near churches and schools are the only way this city can deal with the rising body count. Many of the dead here are from Mary Nino's neighbourhood. When her family first sought refuge at a school, death stalked them. We came here because we thought the flood would return. After two days, my dad did not want to stay here because of the dead bodies all over the place. There were lots over here, there, over there, here too. The smell was strong and unbearable. That's why we left for the church. Mary is surviving on rice and coffee, occasionally canned goods if she can get them. This church remains an evacuation centre. We sleep at night just over there. My younger brother lies beside me. We keep watch over each other. Mary and her family often make the painful journey back to their neighbourhood, relying on friends to inform them if aid has arrived. Now we have to go a long way to even go to the bathroom, all the way to our neighbourhood, just to relieve ourselves. You just have to adjust and not be fussy. Otherwise, you won't be able to help yourself and your family. This is Mary's neighbourhood. Complete obliteration doesn't begin to describe what happened here. My colleague Hannah and I are meeting up with Noel Garcia, an elder here. He shows us a list of 64 names from the neighbourhood, which includes entire families and two of his own relatives. Most of these are, uh, are um, dead already. Only this um, part where they noted that they are missing. So they, of the 64 or people... Most are dead. Noel is in survival mode. His neighbourhood's livestock are dead and the coconut farms are destroyed. If his district doesn't get help soon, he worries those who survived will move to the capital, Manila. Our town hall stood here. This was where our chapel was. Here you see all the houses that have been totally destroyed. There is nothing left. It is so hard. There are people who have left for Manila now. So there are only a few of us left to rebuild. Noel says they've only received one supply of aid. Half the neighbourhoods, which make up Tanawan, face a similar predicament, abandonment. Relief takes three days to get here. They want us to go and get it from the city hall, but they should be the ones to deliver it here. They have the vehicles. They say the issue is the roads, but we've cleaned them up when we hear aid is coming. It's been over a week since the typhoon hit. Tell me some of the problems that you're still facing. What we need right now is water, because we can't drink the water we have here. We have sick children who need medicine and mosquito nets. At the town hall, Mayor Peltexon and his wife are coordinating relief efforts. The mayor says he felt ready for Haiyan. This nation of small islands sits on a typhoon belt 
and faces 20 storms every year. Residents were warned, evacuation centres were set up, but no one anticipated the five metre wall of water. All the emergency supplies were on the ground floor of this building. Surge, we were not ready. How high was the water? About this side, uh, that, you see this, this area? That is not how high it was. So where the sign is, is that correct? The town a little, was... A, a little lower that, that, this side. Okay. This side, that, that, that was how high it was. So could you put any supplies up on the roof at all? Was there any chance that you could no put... No more, because it came so fast. The same covers, and this was, we were staying in the ground floor here. So we were also running after our lives now. And uh, we were, we wanted to move to the second level. But the second level, as you can see, are all glass windows. And the windows were shattering. They were like bullets. Right now, Pell is starting from square one. He's trying to feed 10,000 households on scarce supplies. So of the supplies, you said they were all wet by the by the yeah, and many of them flashed out, washed out. So did you have anything to work with once you came out in the afternoon? No, many of the food were wet, but we still managed to distribute any anyway some of the food. Our fire truck got washed away. In this disaster-prone country, local governments like his are expected to be the first responders. Pell believes this approach needs to change. National government should take take the lead in the in the emergency response. Do you think things will change after this disaster? Yes, I think so. The, essentially, local government were victims themselves. Okay, so ideally, like the initial preparations, like uh, relief goods and so on, medical uh, response would come from the local government. But the problem was it got all damaged by this kind. So I think we we have to tweak a bit now the the model. Tanawan's town hall has become a makeshift hospital. The deputy mayor, a trained doctor, says they're running out of medicine. In this room, a surgical team from Japan has carried out 170 operations in just a few days. This patient's right foot has been severed to the bone. They'll be battling injuries for beyond six months. Some of these people have uh, are really got some serious, serious injuries. Mark Coburn and his international volunteer team, RescueNet, has set up a clinic on the top floor of the town hall. It's not easy treating patients when it rains because the building lost half its roof. Look around you, mate. <laughs> This is only a, a council building, and you've only got to look around you. This is not a hospital. This is absolutely filthy. But we just, we've just got to do the best we can. Their long-term uh, problem is going to be battling the infection. Many patients' wounds have become infected from wading in dirty water. This woman is a typical case. Her toes are stuck together from fungal growth. Mark thinks in some ways this is a harder assignment than the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, which claimed a quarter of a million lives. Like with the tsunami in Indonesia, it just pushed it way back. You know, there were still little bits behind, but here you've still got debris, and so people are trying to climb into the debris to try to find their stuff and coming up every day with fresh injuries. Another uniqueness here probably is, um, you know, you can't control all the, the little water pools everywhere and so that's going to be bringing in vector-borne diseases, um, you know, your dengue, your malaria, you know, cholera. Medical workers are also concerned about the post-traumatic stress that will emerge in the days, weeks and months to come. Most vulnerable are the 1.7 million children left homeless. Nobody gets traumatised uh, as much as the kiddies. You know, there's kids running around down there that have had their entire family, cousins, uncles, aunties, mum, dad, brother, sister, gone. You know, and, and they're trying to find some semblance of normality. 
12-year-old Angela lives amongst the rubble. After the typhoon, she had to loot shops and scavenge to survive. There's a bad smell. Yes. Why is that? Dogs. Dogs? Dead dogs. I don't know. Is it straight over? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. She now lives here with her neighbours after her home was destroyed. So this is your house? Yes. Where you're staying now? This is my house there. <laughs> <laughs> so where where do you sleep where do you sleep? In there. <laughs> yeah. And, and how many other people share this place? So many. When I first found Angela wandering the streets, I asked her where her parents were. Her quiet response floored me. They're both dead, she said. Angela had to formally identify her father for the rescue workers. My father died there. My brother and I went back to the home and we saw a dead body. It was my father. I cried. I was hoping it wasn't him because he was lying face down. My brother buried the body near the sea, and then I started looking for my mother. You told your parents we should evacuate, didn't you? Tell me about that. They didn't evacuate. My brother told them to, but my mother was worried people would steal their belongings. My brother told her, don't worry, all the houses will be damaged anyway, but they didn't listen. Angela eventually left with her brother for their neighbour's house. I dream about my father, and sometimes I can feel his spirit. I dreamt that I went back to where he was found dead, and he was no longer there. Angela spends her days loitering around the town centre, where aid is distributed, asking people in queues to help her. She can't get aid herself because only adults are given claim stubs. When I went to get relief goods, they ask for my name. When I said it was Angela, they say my name is not on the list. So they told me to leave, and I left. If they don't have the stop, we cannot, OK? Limited aid is coming in because of severely damaged transport routes, low fuel supplies and concerns over security. In searing heat, everyone is afraid to miss their turn. Sadly, this is the reality of life for people in Tanoan. They have to wait for hours and hours for all sorts of relief goods, noodles, canned foods, anything they can get their hands on. And the end of the queue ends right over there. The roads are opening up, so more relief is on its way. The Red Cross estimates they'll be providing outreach here for another 18 months. But there are small signs of normality. Locals are setting up street stores. We need money should the stores start opening because aid can only last two days and we don't get it every day. Elmer and his brother have started fixing bikes outside their hut. We have to pay high prices. That's why we are asking for higher prices. It's a risky business venture. Bikes are now used sparingly because of high petrol prices. The gas prices went up from 60 pesos to 200 pesos per litre since the storm, so it's very hard for us to do this. You only have to drive around the danger zone to see an economic recovery is a long way off. Shops are in ruins, and factories that employed hundreds are completely destroyed. Reconstruction will involve changing Tanawan's layout and moving entire communities. I'm now considering of, of relocating the families there to another place. I will not allow any more settlement along the shorelines. 
and we will have to relocate the families. Okay, so that area along the shoreline should be a no-build zone. Rebuilding the island of Leyte could take years. For now, many survivors like Mary want to escape the tangled mess of homes, cars and debris. We have plans to go to the capital, Manila, to stay with our aunt, who has offered to help us temporarily. But my brother wants us to come back here once Tanawan recovers. Although we survived the storm, my brother thinks we might die of hunger if we do not leave this place now. But coming back here means confronting what happened. Today, Mary is returning to her family home. It was over there where I almost drowned. We held onto each other as the big waves crashed onto us. The rain was hurting our skin. She says all her family could do was huddle together. We would just try to guess for some air before the next wave would take us under. We would just keep praying and praying. My brother just kept screaming, hang on, hang on. The walls of the house were swept away. Mary's father, mother and sister-in-law soon followed. Only she and her two brothers were left, fighting a war against the waves. Excuse me, because it is painful to remember. When the water subsided, Mary's father was found alive. But her sister-in-law is still missing. I don't know what to do. I was the eldest child here, but I was helpless. I wish I had been washed away with my mother. Then maybe I could have saved her. I wish that my mother was here instead of me. It soon becomes too much and she breaks down. After three days of searching, her brother found their mother's body in a nearby neighbourhood. My mother was hanging dead from a coconut tree, holding a wallet open and looking at a family picture. My brother didn't know how to retrieve the body. He was just shocked by the sight of our mother, looking at a picture of us before she died. I never told her but I wanted to build my mother a house. She was poor. I wanted to give her a better life and her own grandchildren. I want to return here one day because we were born here. And my mother's presence will always be a part of this place. Typhoon Haiyan washed away not only people's lives, but their plans and big dreams as well. All of it. In this challenging situation, where the typhoon hit and washed us away, we can erase it from our memories, if we try. The struggle of survivors is described as resilience. A term some Filipinos dislike, as it implies they're used to tragedy and picking up the pieces again and again. One million homes were destroyed nationwide by Typhoon Haiyan. In 2011, the UN ranked the Philippines one of the worst nations for disaster preparedness. Tanawan and other cities know they need better action plans for the future. Because the killer storms will come again. <laughs>